Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Ready Goal Politics. Make sure to like this video down below and subscribe to the channel if you are new. So we had a slate of results last night out of a plethora of states here, um, mainly Mississippi, Utah, Oklahoma, New York, Illinois, Colorado, and a special election we'll get to uh, in Nebraska. And it was just a mixed bag. There were some very positive results out of last night. It was not a complete and total failure. But it was not exactly the night that we all wanted, at least from the America First populist right. So we're going to dive into this. And yes, we saw two Rhino incumbents get primaried out by America First candidates, and we do love to see it. And we're going to start off with Mississippi's fourth, because it happened in Mississippi's fourth, where a grassroots challenger to Stephen Palazzo was running. Uh, Stephen Palazzo has a lot of ethics investigations for corruption. He is also somebody who voted for jab databases, has been a leading advocate for that. And he's not the worst Republican in Congress, but at the same time, he's fairly weak, and we were able to get him out of there in Mississippi and put somebody else who was much better in there, which was a very good thing. But then we have to get to the result of the night that was just awful. It was sad. It was a train wreck. Michael Guest won big. And Michael Guest doubled his vote total from the round one. And I did a video on this race because it was so important. Michael Guest is a total and complete rhino. We get that. He cares more about what's happening halfway across the globe than he cares about what's happening at home. When it comes to the issue of the 1-6 committee, he's basically been in lockstep with Liz Cheney, voted to establish this show trial commission right here that we have now. He's also donated billions of dollars his entire career to Planned Parenthood of all people. And he had the audacity to get his boy, Kevin McCarthy, to pour a million dollars into this race and basically say, Michael Cassidy is a socialist because Michael Cassidy wants to spend 30 billion on this family incentivization plan, despite the fact that Michael Cassidy at large is far more fiscally conservative than Michael Guest one could say. Michael Guest has voted for all of Biden's spending bills. Michael Cassidy wouldn't do that. And on top of it, he was just lying nonstop. You want to talk about who the socialist rhino is? It would be Michael Guest, the guy that votes to give Planned Parenthood billions of dollars, the guy that gives $40 billion a year to Ukraine. But at the same time, if Michael Cassidy wants to incentivize family growth when we have a serious problem where our birth rate is 1.7, um, it's an absolute disaster for these people if you're able to even just fathom that idea because, oh, it's spending, but they're the ones that sit back here and spend nonstop. These people have an agenda. That's all it's about. And Michael Guest would not have won in a fair fight, obviously, in my opinion, because he got his DC boys to pour a lot of money into this race at the last minute, and he hoodwinked a lot of boomers with the socialist stuff. I mean, that word, like, seriously, it's lost its meaning. Michael Guest, it applies more to him than it does Michael Cassidy, one could say. But either way, it's disappointing. It is what it is. I had a gut feeling the guests would pull it off because of this vote dump, because of the money dump into it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's like, uh, I didn't know it would be by 30 points. And this is a problem. We have a lot of work to do to counter the lies that the establishment pushes against America first candidates. So we'll move on to Utah right here. Mike Lee won his primary. He was being challenged, uh, not by some like people that were challenging him to his right. I mean, Mike Lee himself is not perfect, but he had rhino challengers. Becky Edwards of the Lincoln Project, darling of Utah. She only got 29.5% of the vote, which is way too high, by the way. Uh, sadly, down ballot, some rhinos won their primaries. Blake Moore did. He only got 58.7% of the vote, though. Um, and even Burgess Owens, who, again, he's not perfect, but... He's probably their best representative. He was being primaried to the left, and he only got 62% of the vote, which it's like, I don't know what is going through these voters' heads. I understand Utah politics are different. You know, you have different types of primaries in Utah, for sure, than you do elsewhere. But at the end of the day, it's like, seriously, a lot of these voters need to get it together. They don't know what they're voting for, which brings us to Oklahoma, by the way. Uh, perfect timing in terms of voters that don't know what they're voting for. Thankfully, Mark Wayne Mullen in the special Senate election primary is being forced into a runoff with T.W. Shannon, which is good. Obviously, we love to see that. Uh, Mark Wayne Mullen is a rhino. He will be a direct replacement for Jim Inhofe in the state. He will be another Lankford. We don't want that. He did his neocon stunt in Afghanistan last year. He's voted to put uh, transgenders in, in women's uh, health facilities uh, with the reauthorization of VAWA. T.W. Shannon is somebody who's better on the issues overall. I'm not saying he's perfect, 
But compared to Mark Wayne Mullen, he needs to beat Mullen in the runoff. Hopefully Trump steps in and endorses him. But I mean, even so, will it be enough if Mullen's already pulling 44? And the fourth place challenger that got 11.3% was the chief of staff for Inhofe. So I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, James Langford won big as well, uh, bigger than I thought he would win by. Uh, Lemire only got 26.4%. And it's like a lot of Trump's base, they love Trump. Uh, they like authentic conservatism. They like what it stands for. But at the end of the day, they go out there and they vote for somebody like James Lankford, who says that Trump's challenges to the 2020 results were racist and has just slammed anything that resembles anti-establishment politics his entire career. Jackson Lemire was much better on the issues. He was somebody who was like a Christian nationalist. Uh, he only got 26.4%. Good grassroots effort, but not good enough, especially when you consider the fact that Kevin Stitt only got 69.1% of the vote. And I don't really know what these primary challengers all stood for. The only problem I've had with Kevin Stitt is he's very weak on some crime issues. Like he primaried Julius Jones, who was obviously guilty. Um, but I, I can't fathom that that's where a lot of that uh, anti-Stitt vote in the primary would really come from. So beyond that point, there's going to be a primary in the second district that will take place, a runoff uh, that will take place on the same day as the Senate runoff for the special election, Avery Fricks and Josh Brichine. We'll see what happens there. But this race was wide open. You only had two candidates that ended up getting more uh, than 13% of the voters. So, I mean, you didn't have anybody crack 15. That's how crowded the field was there. Um, down ballot, Stephanie Bice, she won 68 to 32. Maybe, you know, her or Lucas could be 2024 20, primary targets, obviously, if they're only getting in the 60s right now, who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but New York, we'll move on there, where Lee Zeldin won his primary. Lee Zeldin's probably the most electable candidate overall to take on Kathy Hochul. It's a long shot either way, but he won very big. Uh, he did very well on Long Island. He was pulling in some of these counties like 76% in Suffolk. Uh, he was doing very well upstate. Uh, Andrew Giuliani, he did very well in New York City. Obviously, the Giuliani name plays out very well there. Um, but outside of New York City, it was all Zeldin for the most part, besides some little pockets for some minor candidates there. But the primary for the House elections is delayed until August because of the fact that the maps were redrawn. Thankfully, we love to see that the gerrymander that was like super damn favorable is out the window and the map is like better for Republicans than the current maps. You love to see it. But Illinois, Darren Bailey, Trump's endorsed candidate, uh, he won big. He destroyed the competition. He won by 41 uh, points in the uh, statewide primary for the Illinois governorship there. Bailey is probably going to go down in November, but the margin could very well be within 15 because Pritzker's not really super popular among independent voters in the state. Kathy Salvi won the Senate primary uh, in, in the state as well, uh, but it is unlikely that she is going to win in November. Uh, furthermore, down ballot, there were some interesting results. Mary Miller defeated Rodney Davis. Rodney Davis, he supports DACA. He supports, you know, foreign wars. He voted to condemn Trump for pulling troops out of Syria. He's a neocon. He is awful. And he's like very weak on like some other stuff. Like he supports the alphabet agenda in its full form. It's an absolute disaster for Rodney Davis. He's weak on every single issue, except maybe some like fiscal issues that Mary Miller's about the same as him on. And Mary Miller, despite the controversies, uh, Trump's endorsement carried her to the finish line. She won by 16 points. You absolutely love to see it. It was a brutal beatdown. It was very similar. I called it. I said it would be the same margin or so as the McKinley Mooney race in West Virginia. And so it was. Uh, furthermore, down ballot, not a lot really took place there. I mean, Catalina Lauf won her primary, but she'll probably lose in November again. She's somebody that is, uh, she espouses some leftist rhetoric on something. She's very weak on immigration, but uh, either way, she's in like a Biden plus 10, 11 district, so it really doesn't matter. And, and even if she wins, it's like having another Valadeo in Illinois. Uh, but beyond that point, we also have to check in on Colorado. Uh, not a lot happened. Uh, the Senate primary there, Joe Odea, who is the more establishment candidate, he defeated Ron Hanks. A lot of crossover voting took place in Colorado. A lot of independents, left-leaning independents, they can vote in Republican primaries. Probably should change that, but it allowed Joe O'Day to win. He probably is a stronger general election candidate uh, because he's less polarizing in a state like Colorado. But at the, at the end of the day, he's probably not going to win you know, the whole Lecterbro narrative, oh, we got to nominate the establishment guy. He's going to pose a threat even in Colorado. It's like, no, 
I mean, he might lose by, I don't know, five instead of seven. Like, that's it. Like, a lot of these people don't understand how politics works. But furthermore, Lauren Boebert, however, she was facing a high-profile challenger from a state senator who was a rhino that Dems were crossing over to vote for him. It didn't matter. She won two to one. I mean, she won big, almost like MTG margins. Uh, so you love to see that, absolutely. In the third district, she pulled off a win despite all of the slanderous lies that they've been throwing at her. You know, they did the, the thing to her that they did to Madison Cawthorn. Um, they, they basically said she was a prostitute and had all these abortions. It was totally a lie. Like, the Cawthorn stuff was actually true, but the Boebert stuff was objectively false. It was so bad. Nobody bought the lies, and she won big, so you love to see it there in Colorado. So furthermore, Nebraska, there was also a special election. I didn't even know this was happening until my live stream was going on. That's how uh, under the radar it was. And everybody's dooming about it. You have all the doomers. Uh, they're just going crazy about this because Republicans underperformed in it. Um, and that was surprising. Mike Flood, who won the primary by a resounding margin, only won the special election by six and a half points or so. Um, and he outperformed Trump in a lot of these rural counties, but in Lancaster County, he did underperform vastly. He underperformed in the eastern part of the district as well. Now, there were a lot of people that were confused. They didn't even know if they lived in that district, which kind of explains it to an extent. Uh, and it was very low profile. And Mike Flood was taking over from a uh, a scandal-plagued incumbent that typically happens. It doesn't really matter what the national environment is. And Patty Panzing Brooks actually ran a moderate Democrat campaign. Now, it was probably a fake moderate campaign, but she had good messaging for the district, especially in Lancaster County. And she almost, I mean, she didn't almost win, but she got close, closer than expected. Uh, she outperformed Biden in the new district by, I believe, like five or six points. But again, this is what happens when you have a scandal-plagued incumbent that exits a seat. And people are going to be like, oh, it's over. Look what Rose's doing. And it's like, no, all these votes were pretty much cast before the decision. A lot of the Dem votes were mail-in votes. They were early votes. There, were, I don't believe, was any early voting uh, after the Roe decision. Maybe that day, but that was it. And beyond that point, you talk about who turns out at election day, mainly Republicans. They didn't exactly turn out at the rate that they could have, but it was a very unknown election. Low turnout, low funding, 112,000. Uh, for the midterms this year, you're probably going to see, I don't know, what, what, do you, what do you think we'll see? Like close to or over 300,000 votes in that district. And Mike Flood is probably going to end up winning by over 15 points. So it's, it's, it is what it is. But you have a lot of lies and a lot of doomers saying Republicans, they're going to be screwed. They're not going to be able to win. Look at what's going on. And it's like you actually look into what's causing it and you're like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. And we see these polls that are coming out. They have like Herschel Walker down by 10. But it's Quinnipiac. The polls were a disaster, especially early on in 2020 and 2018 and 2016 for a lot of these races. And it's like, we know what's going to happen at the end of the day. I mean, it could get within like three points or so. Georgia's trending to the left, but still, uh, Raphael Warnock is not beating the hometown legend Herschel Walker uh, at the end of the day in this national environment. We understand that by now, but uh, a lot of people will be dooming about polls that come out. And we know how these polls operate. We've been here before. Remember, you know, the polls at this stage in the game in 2010 and 2014 even. Like Republicans didn't have a resounding lead in 2010 until like August, September. The red wave is still on. Roe, I might do a video on this tomorrow, uh, but Roe v. Wade being overturned, I firmly believe that if anything, it might even help Republicans by just a little bit. Uh, obviously, will it energize Dems for now? Yes. But it will also then in turn energize Republicans. Politics is a pendulum. You energize one side, the other side. And this day and age is going to be just as energized in return. And this is not going to impact anything. And any quote unquote conservative out there that says, oh, it's a disaster because of my midterms. Like even if Roe did cause the midterms to not be a red wave, I don't care. I think that overturning it is far more important, in my opinion, because of what it actually does. It, it saves lives. Overturning it does. Uh, and as a result, I think that's more important than any remedial election victory. But either way, it's not going to halt the red wave. I mean, it might uh, energize Dems for a little bit here and there, but I don't really think so. I mean, I went to some uh, protests over the past weekend and you had 10 people, 10 people showing up for the pro-choice protest in Houston. That shows you how energized they truly are. Uh, it's a settled decision. It's over. We won. They take the L. They're demoralized. But anyways, guys, Thanks for watching this video. Like this video down below. Comment down below. Subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications so you never miss another video. Follow me on social media. The links are all in the description down below.
As always, guys, thanks for watching. Red Eagle, out.